So yeah, I'm Italian. It will be a lot of fun. Uh, first speaker of the first session, the first big session for the Apply Data. So uh, thanks. This is this is a lot. It looks professional. Um, how do you fight this pressure? Uh, you just have a pizza before the, the talk. This is how we do it. I had a pizza before for breakfast, and I'm ready to talk. How many data scientists today? OK, real data scientists. No, just, just two, just two people. That's fine. So today I'm going to talk about digital experimentation from A-B testing to causal inference. I say inference and not inference. Um, let's have a Q&A afterwards, I would say. So um, what are we going to see today? We will start from an introduction about digital experimentation. We want to have a look at some basics. And then we check what A-B testing is, and we go from A-B testing to causal inference. We will put together these elements with a very nice use case I prepared for you, which is about what happened to Stack Overflow when ChatGPT was released. Uh, and I imagine that we can all relate with that. This is going to happen to us in a few years. And towards the end, I will share some tips, resources, and we will have a look into the conclusions. Who am I? Uh, my name is Alessandro. I work as a data scientist, and uh, I'm located in Hamburg at the moment. And uh, during my career, I had to deal with a lot of different projects, domains. And as you, can, as you can imagine, I had to deal with experiments a lot, online experiments. I had to test my models. I had to design experiments for someone else. I had to check results from existing experiments. So it was, it was a big part of what I was doing. And I always found it very fascinating, especially how you can easily do it wrong, me included. But what's an experiment? I like to say that experiments always existed. So we didn't invent experiments. I was talking with someone from Deconium before, and we were actually saying that people were experimenting on people ages ago. So we didn't invent this concept. And in the end, it's just about three steps. We formulate the hypothesis, we design the experiment, and then we test the results. And that's it. But we know that there is more. We know that, that there might be a lot of pitfalls, and we cannot stop here. So what's digital experimentation? I really love to focus on the terminology here, because I think that many people know what an A-B testing is, but maybe they don't really, um, they, they don't really know, they don't master the, 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 the right terminology here. So di digital experimentation is just an umbrella, but then you can have many techniques. We usually talk about A-B testing, but why do we talk about A-B testing? The main reason is because A-B testing is, is easy to implement. You have two groups. Um, is very suitable for online experiments. So there are many reasons why we talk about A-B testing. But there are also some other techniques. There is bandic testing, which is something I implemented some years ago uh, based on the uh, unbanded machines. Um, split URL testing, which was very used before for proxies. So there are many techniques. And when I go to companies, they, um, they always talk about A-B testing. But let's try to make the right terminology uh, famous again. What's an A-B testing? In the end, A-B testing is a systematic way to uh, test something in a very controlled environment. One example is, uh, we can say, one simple website. This is a website. I, I hope you can recognize it, but this is a website. And let's say we want to change one small component. We want to go from the rounded element, we can see it as a button, to the triangle, the red triangle. And uh, how can we be sure that this will have a positive impact on our user base, on, uh, on the traffic, on, on the product sold, if we're talking about uh, an e-commerce? How can we know that? Well, we run, we design, and we execute. We run an online experiment. So we change only one small thing in his website, and we see what happens. How do we design it? If we, as, as you saw, we started with three simple steps for experiments, and now we have a very long checklist. 
with a lot of scary world, words like sam sample size estimation, control treatment, uh, it's getting very serious. So what do we do? First, we want to create our control and treatment. And the way we, with the way we create it is by assign, uh, randomly assigning the users to these two groups. One group will see the version of the website where nothing changes, so we can see the version of the, the website we have in production. And another group will see the version of the website where only this small element changes. Then we need to focus on the variable, which is the, the button, this, this, this component we want to change. We don't want to make many changes. We want to only make one change. That's because we want to be sure that the effect we will see in the results is coming from our changes. This is very important. As well as we want to, as we said, randomly assign the users because we don't want any kind of bias in the data. Bias in the data is going to be translated into um, effects we cannot control. If something else is influ influencing our experiment, we don't know if it's us actually um, creating this effect in the results or if it's something else, like a bias in the data. Then we want to define the performance metrics. This is, also, this is something that many people I see, uh, it's not that they do it wrong, but they don't understand how much important it is. We were talking about checking the traffic of the website or maybe the product sold, but it's really important because this is not just a technical uh, slide of how to design an A-B exper testing experiment, but it's also about how we drive decisions. When we work with A-B testing afterwards, we need to take actions when we look at the results. And we need to understand which metrics we're going to use. If we focus on traffic, we cannot change it afterwards. We have to be sure that we're going to trust the metric, we're going to trust the control and the treatment and the results we get out of the experiment. And, one, and last but not least, which is probably uh, the most tricky part of designing an experiment, is uh, finding the right sample sites and test duration. The sample size is basically helping us to uh, avoid making an important mistake, which is um, seeing something in the results of the experiment and then not being sure if this is happening by chance or if it was us. Let's say um, we can do a small exercise. I have a coin and I flip this coin, but before flipping the coin, we start from the hypothesis that you have some psychic powers. So you are we, you're, you're all magicians. And I ask you, what will be the outcome? You all say head. I toss the coin, and it's head. 90% of you say the head. So we can confirm our hypothesis that you are all magicians. But what's the problem here? Who knows what's the problem? Let's make it interactive. There will be a prize afterward. Who knows what's the problem of the magician's hypothesis? With the microphone, with the microphone, right? I'll ask you, <laughs> what are your thoughts about this? Uh, the other 10%? <laughs> well, 90% say the head, and it was head. What's the problem? We're, you're all magicians, right? We can confirm the hypothesis. There's one mistake in the design. Oh, I'll run over there. One second. But I think the problem is that it was just a one time. Yeah. So it's probably by chance, or? Exactly. It was by chance, right. There is no price. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Never trust data scientists. I'm sorry. Yeah, there is no price. Uh, but that was the right answer. Uh, the sample size was, w w was too small. So we had to go for a longer test duration and a bigger sample size. So what's, uh, how do we? Um, um, evaluate if the experiment was successful. We, we focus on the difference between the results we get from the treatment to the control. Uh, and is it easy, as you can see in this slide? We just, we usually refer to it as treatment effect. Now we have the basics of A B testing. Let's move to causal inference. I like to introduce causal inference with this really interesting plot. How many of you know about this website? It's a lot. Um, so we are looking at some weird correlations for, from the world. There is this website collecting 
uh, amazing correlations. Uh, most of them are very dark, honestly, like this one. Uh, per capita cheese consumption correlates with number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bed sheets. This is a bit better, but usually they're pretty dark. Um, and we see that the Pearson's correlation here is very high. Uh, what's a mistake we can make here? I remember also when my professors told me, were, were keep telling me about um, be careful with the correlation, be careful with the causation. I, I, I honestly, I wasn't really listening. Uh, but today, when you have to train a model, you have a situation like this. You think you're exploiting some correlation in the data, but instead, you don't know if it will be the right, if that, that, that event will be the right and the real cause of the second event we're looking at. So it's really important to understand the difference here. Why, as human beings, when we look at something like this, we know that this is wrong, this is off? Well, we know for sure, given the context, we're talking about divorce in Maine, and before it was uh, per capita cheese consumption. When we look at it and we understand the domain, we know that the divorce rate in Maine cannot be the cause of per capita consumption of margarine. Sometimes this is not as easy. Let's see you get you, you have a high dimensional data sets with, with, with data coming from cars sensors. Some, sometimes the, 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 business and the, the business domain and the knowledge you have is not enough to actually say that the correlation is not equal to the causation. So in this case it's easy, but in some other cases it can be very complicated. But how can you spot this? How can you control situations like this? How can you quantify that uh, quantify this, this, so how can you say that this, the correlation is not equal to the causation? If you, if you want to focus on the causation, how can you quantify the, the cause of this event? So let's take one step back. What's causal inference? I remember this really nice talk from a PyCon some years ago, and this guy was talking about causal inference as the third stage of data, and I'm still in this, this concept because I love it. What we do in the end is prediction, and we answer the question, what will happen? With the data we have right now, we want to look at the future. Then we have description. Description is answering the question, what is there? So with the data we have currently available, we're going to answer questions like, where do we have the highest traffic rate? And then there is causal inference, which is something new. The question is, what would happen? How the traffic would have changed if ChatGPT had not been released? This is tricky, right? This already happened. How can we answer this question? When we usually need causal inference, just to give you more context, usually when A-B testing is not possible, when we want to identify the cause of an event, where, or where we, where, when we want to verify existing correlations, like what we were trying to do before, the slides, correlations versus causation. Now, let's put together all these elements in a very simple use case, which uh, will definitely help you to understand how you can apply these concepts. But in particular, this is useful. We're, we're just scratching the surface here. There are many things we can say about this. Out of this presentation, we can have 100 presentations, probably. But what, what I want to do here is um, showcase one way to use causal inference in order to answer some questions. I think we all know what happened to Stack Overflow. Who, who doesn't know? Or who knows? It's better. OK, that's better, right? Um, so Stack Overflow's traffic went down by, I think it's 20% today, something like this. Um, and uh, people think that, that was, uh, it was caused by the release of ChatGPT. I also believe that that was the, the, the reason, probably. Um, and the data are clear about what happened. But how can we be sure that we're not looking at one of those weird correlations we had before in the data? We, we're not. It might be one of those. Maybe this will be part of these websites one day. So let's focus on some causal hypothesis. We focus on this problem now. We want to break it down and see if we can do something with this data. I like to call them causal hypotheses just to highlight the fact, to stress the fact that we're looking at causal inference. And these hypotheses sound a bit weird and hard to, to, to answer. Did ChatGPT significantly contribute to the decline in traffic? 
or to what extent is ChatGPT responsible for the decrease in traffic? How can we answer these questions? Right? This is something that belongs to the past. So this already happened. And um, now we're looking at uh, data that have been collected already after one, one, one single event, which is ChatGPT. And we have this data stored somewhere, which is the Stack Overflow's traffic. And we cannot do anything about that. What are we missing here? We're missing the control group. We do have the treatment group. The treatment group is Stack Overflow's traffic. We have the data of what happened to Stack Overflow after ChatGPT's re Chat GPT release. But we don't have the control, because the control belongs to a world where ChatGPT didn't exist. And this is how causal inference is usually explained. There is, a, there is another world where, where something is different. In this world, we don't have ChatGPT. ChatGPT didn't help me to write this presentation. It would have been <laughs> a mess, probably. Um, but it, in our world, we have the treatment. And it will, it, it, this, this, this is basically the solution here. What if we have the control? Someone actually found a sort of solution for this. And uh, these two researchers in this article explain how they wanted to create this kind of synthetic control. What they did is focusing on um, regions around the main region that they were studying, where there was a civil war, and they used this data from these regions where they didn't have a civil war. And they used this data to uh, predict the outcome of what would have happened if the civil war was not there. So they basically built a synthetic control. So if we don't have a synthetic control, if we don't have a control, we just predict it. They refer to these this, uh, regions, this data that they used to predict the synthetic control as donors. So what they did is building a donor pool. We can do the same. So we know that there are some platforms which we think are similar to um, Stack Overflow. And we can use this platform, that the traffic from this platform, so we're talking about time series here, to build this donor pool. And what's the assumption here? There is a very important assumption. The assumption is that we believe that these platforms have not been affected by the treatment. This is a very strong assumption. And I mean, I think the data science is full of assumptions. So we should, not be, uh, we should not be too worried about this. In this case, I decided to go with Pandas, Matplotlib, and GitHub. And we will use this time series to build a synthetic control. But before diving into a small piece of code, um, I put in this presentation, I want to introduce one simple but powerful concept, which is confounders. Confounders in causal inference, but in general, uh, digital experimentation, are something that um, affect the treatment and the outcome at the same time. How can we explain this? Let's use an example. I see in the data that when I sell a lot of ice cream, this is affecting the number of people getting a sunburn. What is missing here? Confounders are missing. To give you more context, there would be a price now. To give you more context, uh, what we were looking at before, these weird correlations, it might be possible that there were some confounders there. So it might be possible that the real cause, the, the, the events we were looking at, was coming from somewhere else. And this is exactly one of those cases. Imagine two uh, time series of, from the number of ice cream sold and uh, people getting a sunburn. And you see this very high correlation, but we know that something is missing. What is missing? The confounder, which is affecting treatment control. Now the price time. And you, have you need to believe me that there will be a price. What's the confounder here? I'll come to you. Who was that? We don't have two prices. <laughs> yeah, please. I said weather. 
yeah. And another answer, another answer, maybe if someone wants to add something. Uh, seasonality, so season, summer. Okay, you, you're both correct. Uh, let's, let's, let's not <laughs> say anything about the price. We already said that. Um, so yeah, it's summer, the weather. Summer is actually affecting the number of uh, ice cream sold and people getting a sunburn. And uh, imagine you want to m train a model based on the number of ice cream sold in order to predict how many people will get a sunburn, and you will fail. And what's said about this is that people, data scientists, do this very often. I, I, I also do it sometimes, because as I said, sometimes the domain is not as easy as this, what we're looking at, at summer ice cream and sunburn. Sometimes you have these high dimensional data sets, and sometimes the variables are not easy to understand, and you see a correlation, a very high correlation, which is very rare, and you're like, okay, let's exploit it, let's build a model on top of that. And then you think you can predict how many people will uh, die by being tangled in their bed sheets. So what can be, um, if, we, if, we, if we go back to our problem, we can, have, we can have confounders, right? So time can be one of, <coughs> one of those, sorry, um, other competitive platform. And uh, technical changes, maybe Stack Overflow was actually doing something under the hood that, that created an outage. So the, the, there might be some, some confounders. For this presentation, we do it completely wrong. We say there are no confounders. Honestly, I believe that even if we have confounders, they're not as strong as we think, because probably ChatGPT was the real cause of circular flows traffic to go down. And uh, Fry is really overthinking here. And let's assume there are no confounders. But this slide is to highlight the fact that you need to think about this. Confounders can be very dangerous and also useful, because you can exploit confounders if you want. For instance, whenever you're going to calculate the treatment effect. Now, let's move to the implementation. That's pretty much it. Causal Pi is doing the job for you. If you work with time series and you want to dive into causal inference, Causal Pi is providing an amazing interface. What you have to do is provide in the data frame, decide which kind of function you want to use. In this case, I'm using a linear regression function. And then it will take care of all, all these complicated and, and hard causal rules and, and graph and whatever you and just, just name it. And you don't have to think about those things. What you get out of it is really nice and is the time series of what would have happened. So what would have happened to Stack Overflow if we didn't have ChatGPT? But even more, you can quantify the causal impact, which is what we were missing for, from the weird correlations before. We didn't have any causal impact. We, didn't, we were not able to quantify if these two, how much the first event was causing the second one to decrease or increase. Now, are there any limitations? There are many limitations, and there are many pitfalls. Are these things ready for production? Yes and no. It depends on the domain. I would say more no than yes, but it really depends on the domain. The problem is that we're not here just because we want to um, implement something. We want to go with, with like a, an amazing technical solution. We need to drive decisions. And if we think about the donor pool, the variables are very hard to find. In our case, we use three donor pools, and we started from the, from the assumptions that the donor pool, were, uh, the donors were not, uh, have not been affected by the treatment, but we are not 100% sure. And then we were using only three donors, which was arguable. And then we have, of course, the problem of confounders. They're very hard to identify. And uh, this is something we need to be aware of. So another important, another what, what I want to uh, leave you with is probably the data quality matters. So it's always like this. Uh, in our case, we were looking at, we were looking at some data from, from, from Stack Overflow and ChatGPT and, and GitHub, and these are really to understand, but the world of data is not always as easy as I was showing. 
I'm leaving a couple of books, papers, and videos. Uh, the books are basically what I use to understand what causal inference is. Some, some of them are a bit technical, but if you want to dive into a very nice library, Causal Pi does the job, as well as Do Why from Microsoft. And that's it for today. I hope you liked it, and please ask questions.